The beautiful Alpine country of Switzerland has been a popular destination for travelers for many centuries. Tourists have been drawn here by the majestic scenery and beneficial climate. Soaring peaks have proved a magnet for mountain climbers since Victorian times, while the less energetic have no lack of scenic attractions on more level ground. Lac Léman, named by the Romans Lacus Lemanus, marks the border between France and southwestern Switzerland. Its northern shore is often called the Swiss Riviera. This once rural region has changed greatly since the days when the Romans had settlements here. Even as late as the early 19th century, the romantic poets Byron and Shelley could wander beside the lake in solitude. Today the shore is busy and proves a popular location for people of all ages and interests, with its many piers and leafy boulevard which runs all the way to Vevey. The warm waters are an attraction for bathers in the summer, while a leisurely trip down to Geneva or over to France can be made in one of the many lake steamers. The ancient castle of Chillon holds a key defensive position where the mountains drop almost sheer into the lake, forcing travelers to pass close to the shore. In the 12th century, the Counts of Savoy enlarged an existing watchtower into a fortified castle, which was to become one of their chief strongholds. They built not on the limited shoreline, but on a small island just a stone's throw removed. With the tolls they extracted from the numerous merchants and pilgrims forced to pass by on their way from France to Rome, they extended the castle into an impressive complex. Although its reputation today is as a fortress, immortalized by Lord Byron in his poem, The Prisoner of Chillon, it also served as a comfortable lakeside home for the counts and their dependents. The town of Montreux, a little further down the lake, blossomed in the last century to become a fashionable resort, with grand hotels and a casino springing up to cater for the numerous wealthy visitors who flocked here from all parts of Europe and North America. Its population trebled between 1880 and 1910. The importance of the clientele is reflected in the grand architecture, much of which still survives, contributing a gracious touch to the modern town. Even the station building was given an imposing facade, emphasizing its importance. Here there are no less than three different lines, each running on separate gauges. The standard gauge main line of the Swiss National Railway brings passengers from Italy and from France in expresses hauled by the powerful RE44 locomotives. In contrast, the little Rochers de Ney rack railway runs on 800 mm track on its spectacular mountain ascent. While in the center of the station are the meter gauge tracks of the Montreux Oberland Bernois Railway, the trains of which will take us on a journey through some of Switzerland's most beautiful scenery. The route ahead will take us from the lake shore at Montreux to Zweitzimmen in the mountains of the Bernese Oberland at the heart of Switzerland. En route, we will pass through fertile river valleys and over two watersheds. In order to gain enough height on the first part of the journey from Montreux to the tunnel at Jour, the line is forced to make four large sweeps up and down the lakeside. The first part of the line was opened in December 1901, 20 months after the start of construction. Although parts of Montreux station remain recognizable even today, the sheds have expanded greatly to take the varied stock now in use. Our train glides out of the station and almost immediately climbs a 1 in 15 gradient ramp before plunging into a tunnel which will turn the track right around to begin the climb out of the town. Montreux station lies at 395 meters above sea level and we must gain almost 700 meters in height before reaching Jaw, so it's uphill all the way. The hills above Montreux are covered in vineyards, 
for this region has been producing wine since Roman times. The grapes grow and ripen in the warm summer sun to provide quality wines to delight the connoisseur. The chateau of Châtelard, built on a defensive hill overlooking the lake, now has a more peaceful role as a romantic location for wedding receptions. The line has now reached the end of the first sweep down the lake and turns in a large curve back on itself before arriving at the first schedule stop at Fontanivon station. Between 1911 and 1955, the train connected here with the Clarence Chailly Blonnet tram. Nowadays, the timetable is less hectic and the station mistress has time to tend her flower baskets between trains. At Chernay, the large buildings of the MOB workshops dominate the village. This is the main depot of the railway, and since its opening in 1907, has been responsible not just for repairs, but also for design and building of stock. The route has always been worked by electric traction. The first series of motor coaches built between 1901 and 1912 were only lightly powered and often ran double-headed. Most have now gone but some still remain on light duties, with modifications to one of their pantographs. In the 1930s, two FZE 66 articulated motor baggage cars were introduced. These had 1,000 horsepower motors and were capable of maximum speeds of 55 kilometers per hour. Ten years later, they were joined by six new motor coaches, two of which have now been modified to form two-car shuttles for local duties, while their four counterparts have more prestigious duties on the line. The motor coach hauling our train is one of the 4000 series which came into service in 1968. These are double car sets capable of being driven from either end. The BE44 motor coach trailers introduced in the 1970s work the local stopping services while the most powerful locomotives of the fleet are the 6000 series, whose 1,453 horsepower motors make light of heavy loads. Besides handling standard stock, they also haul the prestigious Panoramic Express trains, whose luxury coaches give armchair comfort for the journey, together with a tempting buffet service. With the chance to have a cool beer while viewing spectacular scenery, no wonder the passengers smile. The ultimate view, however, has to be from the special viewing carriages of the Super Panoramic Express. The locomotives hauling these are modified 3000s, running in tandem. And the workshops at Chernay can take much of the credit for the modifications to today's coaches and locomotives. The MOB were adept at recycling stock long before green issues were fashionable, and today the workforce still take a justifiable pride in their labors. At Chernay, the line has gained over 200 meters in height and is well on its way back along the second sweep of the lake. The lovely views from the right-hand side of the train give passengers a glimpse of the French shore. The train is now well out of Montreux, which can be seen far below, basking in the summer sun. Another large horseshoe curve at Sonsier brings the train round 180 degrees to double back on itself at an increased elevation. From the air, the two layers of track are clearly visible, although from the train, the trees allow only tantalizing glimpses of the vista below.
Track repairs are an ongoing task of any railway company, and the MOB is constantly improving the permanent way. The station at Chambly is dominated by the Grand Hotel Narcissus, a contemporary of the railway, named after the beautiful flower which carpets the area in spring. However, for the steam enthusiast, Chambay has another association, for this is one of the termini of the blonnet chambay Steam Preservation Railway. Originally, the line was in commercial use, but after its closure in the 1960s, it was decided to form a living museum, and now, staffed by volunteers, it delights visitors of all ages during summer weekends, while in winter, much important restoration work is carried out. The museum plays a vital role in conserving locomotives and trams from all over Europe, electric and diesel, as well as steam, and the sheds are full of treasures. Locomotives only fully come alive when in action, and rides can be taken in old rolling stock behind one of the many preserved locomotives. Preparations are made to take locomotive number three out for the day. This engine was one of 10 built in 1913 by SLM for the predecessor of the Furka Oberaup company to run between Decentis and Brie and donated to the museum in 1970. Leaving Chambay, our train plunges into a 314-metre-long loop tunnel built in the 1940s, replacing an earlier construction. The track again swings round on itself to emerge for the final run back along the lakeside. At the end of the ridge, the track curves sharply away from the lake to follow the Montreux River Valley towards the Jamon mountain range. On the opposite side of the defile lies the steeply climbing track of the Roches de Ney Railway. The concrete Bardiol viaduct towers 29 metres high above the valley floor. It was built in the 1940s to replace the earlier stone bridge. In order to ascend the 577 metres to Les Avants, we've travelled almost 11 kilometres, three times the distance as the crow flies. The mountain village of Les Avants has been a popular resort since the turn of the century. The beautiful scenery and bracing mountain air were also conducive to longer stays. Noel Coward had a mountain retreat here, and an exclusive girls' finishing school was based near the station. This remained the terminus of the line for almost two years, especially busy in winter when the train brought sledges and skiers up to the snowy slopes. At first, the only goods traffic on the railway was supplies for the local hotels and restaurants. In order to cater for the bobsleigh enthusiasts, 
an electric funicular was opened in 1910, connecting the station to Song Lu on the mountain above. Its half-kilometer track runs on a gradient of 1 in 1.8. We too cling to the steep valley side on our final push towards the Col du Jamin, passing through a series of tunnels cut into the rock face. The gradient here at 1 in 13.7 is not only the steepest found anywhere on this line, but also the steepest of any adhesion railway in Europe. At Jour, the track plunges straight through the very heart of the mountain for some 2,424 meters, crossing the watershed of the Rhone and Rhine rivers. After the tunnel, the route turns its back on the lake scenery, and the track now runs along the Hongrin Valley down to Mont Bovon, before joining the main river Sarine, which it will follow to Chateau Day. The steep, grassy slopes of the summit of the Col du Jamin, high above our train, provide a stark contrast to the fertile Hongrin Valley, with its green fields and lush woodland. Having climbed to a height of just over 1,100 meters to pass through the mountain chain, we now have to lose some 300 meters before reaching Mont Bovon. The tunnel is the boundary between two of Switzerland's 26 cantons, and we've now passed from Canton Vaud into Canton Fribourg. The N-span girder bridge, which crosses the river Flon, was realigned in 1946, one of the many improvements to the line made during that period. After Les Siennes station, the track twists and turns back on itself, running down some of the steepest gradients on the line. A last curve of the track in a perfect 60-meter radius horseshoe brings our train in a graceful sweep towards the end of our descent. The track crosses a viaduct over the Hongrin River at the end of its valley and disappears into a short tunnel to emerge in the picturesque village of Mont Bovon. The line to Mont Bovon was opened on the 1st of October 1903 with much pomp and ceremony. The elaborate sign indicates that this station belongs not to the MOB, but to the GFM railway, whose orange and grey stock takes passengers down to the old wall hill town of Grieur, famous throughout the world for its cheese. The grieur fribourg murat line has sheds and sidings at Mont Bovon, which contribute to an impressive track layout. Both MOB and GFM operate on the meter gauge. The line now follows the valley of the river Sarine up towards its source, and rail and river will never be far apart during this stage of our journey. Although there's a large hydroelectric power scheme which connects Mont Bovon with the Lac du Vernay further up the line, so well is this project disguised that passengers are practically unaware of its existence. Near Latine, the valley closes in and the track plunges into the side of the gorge in a combined tunnel and avalanche gallery. We've now crossed the cantonal border yet again and are back once more in Canton Vaud.
The Sarine is one of Switzerland's major rivers, flowing through no less than four cantons. Its source is found high in the mountains of Canton Valais, near Les Diablerets, and it flows through Bern, Vaux, and Fribourg before joining the river Are and thence into the Rhine. The distinctive tower of the church of saint Donat, poised gracefully on its earth mound, heralds the approach of Chateau Day. The village today is large and prosperous and has long been an important administrative center, first under the Counts of Grieux and later under the rule of Bern. The church is built on the site of an early fortification and has functioned as a place of worship since the late 13th century. The largely wooden construction of the old church and chalets meant a constant risk of fire and the village was destroyed no less than three times between 1664 and 1800. The railway reached Chateau Day on the 19th of August 1904 and the whole village turned out to welcome the train. The community grew and flourished with the arrival of visitors to the region. Some made permanent homes here including the film star David Niven, who was interred in the local cemetery. Chateau Day also welcomes famous visitors to its balloon festival held each January, when over 80 hot air balloons of all shapes and sizes splash their vivid colors over the snow. Sightseeing flights are available, however, throughout the year giving superb views of the surrounding peaks, or a bird's eye impression of the Sarine River. Whitewater rafting is a popular summer pastime with thrills galore during the trip downstream. The river provides an exciting test of teamwork in overcoming the varied obstacles en route. While some play, others have work to do, and summer is always a busy time for farmers. In Switzerland, there's room for both modern technology and more traditional methods. The whole family is expected to help with the haymaking, several generations working side by side. Children living in this region have longer summer holidays, so they can lend a hand. While the grass is harvested in the valleys, the cows graze on the high mountain pastures where they will stay until autumn. Then in winter, these slopes are transformed by a blanket of snow proving a delight for ski enthusiasts. Along with the lush grass, the cows eat the colorful alpine flowers, which help give that special flavor to the milk, which in turn makes tasty chocolate and cheese. The local Leitivar cheese is still produced by 70 families of the district using methods handed down over the years. Fresh milk is slowly heated in a copper cauldron over a log fire. Rennet is added to promote curdling and after further heating, the curds are shredded. The milk must be kept at a constant temperature of about 55 degrees centigrade and stirred for well over an hour to ensure a smooth mixture. The muslin cheesecloth will be so heavy when full Assistance is needed when the curds are removed and the surplus whey drained back into the cauldron. The cheese is shaped in a wooden mold and excessive moisture is removed by the application of a heavy press.
Once the cheese has been dated and numbered, it is left to cure in a vat of brine before storage in cool caves. The finished product is an essential ingredient of the traditional tasty Swiss cheese fondue. After Chateau Day, the line follows the Sarin River Valley as far as Stadt before climbing over the mountains to our destination at Zweitzimmen. Chateau Day lies at the center of the Pays d'Honneau region which was originally ruled by the Counts of Grieur. In 1555, Count Michael went bankrupt and the area was taken over by the Counts of Bern. It wasn't until 1798, after a revolt, that the district became part of Canton Vaux. The train climbs steadily as it passes along the north side of the valley. Rail and road cross at several points along the route, bringing even the grandest of vehicles to a halt in homage to the more senior form of transport. At Gerino, the river flows through a deep and narrow gorge where the mountain ridges close in. For almost the first time since Mont Bovon, our train runs downhill for a little way, giving it a chance to pick up speed. The viaduct crossing the Flandreau River is typical of the original bridges built by the MOB during the construction of the line. Its two end spans, each over 41 meters long, soar 21 meters above the waters flowing down from the surrounding mountains. The village of Rougemont today is a large and thriving community. However, its origins were far more humble. A monastery was built here at the end of the 11th century by Benedictines from the French community of Cluny, on land given by Count Guillaume of Grieux. The monks were not left in peace, however, for the region was the scene of fighting between the Counts of Bern and Grieux. Plague and famine also brought hardship to the area, and in 1480, a great hurricane devastated the valley. The monastery church still survives. It's dedicated to St. Nicholas of Myrna, nowadays best known for bringing gifts to children at Christmas.
Although restoration work has taken place, the interior still contains many original features, such as the arched clerestory windows, which were enclosed when the roof was later realigned. During the Reformation, the monastery was dissolved and the priory buildings destroyed to make way for a well-fortified bailiff's house, which survives today as a gracious private residence. The legacy of the Counts of Grieur can still be seen in the village, where some chalets date back to the 17th century. Fire was a constant risk with open hearths blazing in wooden buildings. And even as late as 1953, four old chalets were razed to the ground. Concern for the environment has led to strict building regulations, which demand traditional styles be maintained with wooden cladding over less potentially dangerous modern building materials. Improvements are constantly being carried out on the line, and at the Van El Gorge, a new tunnel was recently completed. This marks the boundary not only between two cantons, but also two languages. The inhabitants of Canton Vaud speak French, while only meters away, their counterparts in Canton Bern speak a variation of German, known as Schweizerdeutsch. All employees of the MOB must be bilingual, though many staff speak three or more languages. Originally, there was a castle at this point, strategically placed to defend the narrow pass. It was destroyed in 1406, and there's now no trace. The modern rail tunnel runs for 470 meters deep under the solid rock. It was opened on the 28th of June, 1991, having taken just over two years to build. As with all the recent MOB constructions, it's wide enough to take standard gauge goods trucks, which ride piggyback on narrow gauge bogies. The river has undergone a name change at the cantonal boundary and is now known as the Sarnen River. In Sarnen village, the 15th century church of St. Maurice plays host not only to the local congregation, but to international musicians as well. For its wooden roof gives superb acoustics, which make it a sought after venue for concerts during the Menuhin Music Festival, held here every August. The railway arrived in Sarnen in December 1904 and within six months, the line was completed to Zweitzimmen. Up to this time, the only link had been by postcoach from Sarnen to Thun, which had opened in 1845, running three times a week. This proved so popular that within 15 years, daily services were in operation. The last coach departed on July the 6th, 1905, the very day the first train ran along the full length of the line. Today, mail wagons run on the MOB throughout the day, with letters being sorted during the journey. After Sarnen, the track runs in a dead straight line along the valley. Originally, the route was scheduled to climb directly up the mountain to Sarnen Mosa, completely bypassing Stadt. It was only the persistence of Karl Reichenbach, the local sawmill owner, who convinced the company to extend the railway to the resort. His action helped to make the region prosperous. Visitors flocked here in both summer and winter, and within nine years of the opening of the line, no less than seven grand hotels had opened, offering every luxury and amenity to their wealthy and titled guests. Even today, the rich and famous come here for that extra attention. The usual suite at the Stad Palace, a trinket or two from one of the town's exclusive boutiques, 
or perhaps a new look by film star Elizabeth Taylor's favorite hairdresser, followed by an opportunity to exchange gossip in an open-air cafe. However, the village has managed to remain unspoiled and keep its unique charm, even if the Flower Deck Chalet does now house a bank. In the high street, 20th century cars incongruously contrast with the 15th century chapel of St. Nicholas, although you're just as likely to see a tractor as a Porsche. The beautiful facade of the Hotel Olden, though in traditional style, is actually the handiwork of the owner, Hedy Donizetti Mullinger, who also painted the graceful High Street Railway Bridge. In July, sporting fever takes over in Stad. The Swiss Open Tennis Championship has been held here now for over 50 years, bringing tennis stars to mingle with film stars. All the line between Montreux and Zweizimmen is single track, except in stations and passing places. And we must wait for the down train to arrive before we can be given right of way. Our train must now gain height rapidly to climb up the valley side, as the summit of the line lies some 200 meters above us. Some of the gradients ahead will be as steep as one in 25. gives passengers a lofty view of the high street and surrounding chalets. Residents here have included Prince Rainier of Monaco, Liz Taylor, Roger Moore and Julie Andrews. There's a frustratingly quick glimpse of play but no time to pick out the big names on the court. The beautiful Gerda Bridge dominates the outskirts of the town. Its three end span trusses with a combined length of almost 76 meters are supported by graceful stone piers, raising the track over 18 meters above the valley floor. From the right-hand side of the carriage, there are brief glimpses back down the Saan and Valley towards Rougemont, for the track is now doubling back along the Reichenbach curve at right angles to the anticipated line of the railway. The buildings at Gruben are not the usual ticket office and waiting rooms, but accommodation for the transformers and converters which give this stretch of the line its power. This substation was built early in the century, along with five others spaced along the route. The old Umformer station is now no longer in use and has been replaced by a more modern building across the tracks. Today, with more powerful locomotives and larger rakes of coaches, 11 substations are in use, converting the AC power from the national system to the 850 volts DC in use on the line. A consistent power source is essential to the smooth operation of the timetable and catenary servicing is an important part of routine maintenance.
The train makes a final push to reach the summit of the line, some 1,274 meters above sea level. We have climbed 880 meters since the start of our journey in Montreux. This is the watershed between the Saanen and Simmer rivers. But although each goes its own way at this point, the waters will eventually meet again when the rivers they feed flow into the river Are and onto the Rhine and North Sea. Saanen Moser is the highest station on the line, and the new complex built in 1930 replaced a smaller station, though the original building still remains if you know where to look. The once bleak hillside is now a thriving resort, popular with lovers of the outdoors in both summer and winter. The train now runs high along the wooded slopes of the southern side of the Kleiner Simmer Valley. We must slow down here as a new viaduct is under construction, a major work on the line. The straightening of the track, which will result, will help the train keep up its speed along this section, while the graceful concrete and steel curve will, when complete, add yet another majestic setting for that special railway photograph. Cabins of the Rinderberg cable car pass overhead, traveling between Zweitzimmen and the mountain summit over a thousand meters above. The passing place contains a train spotter's delight. Between the four varied coaches are motor coach 3002 and one of its sisters in the dark blue super panoramic livery, with all four pantographs making contact. In order to lose the height needed before reaching Zweitzimmen, the train has to make a diversion up the main Simmer Valley. At the end of the run, the line loops round in a new spiral tunnel 420 meters long, whose exit can be glimpsed through the trees. 
The Musbach stream is now safely confined in an aqueduct over the tunnel entrance, having flooded the old construction to within half a meter of the roof during a storm in 1983. The new Musbach tunnel was opened the following year. The final sweep along the hillside reveals a second track down on the valley floor. This time it's not a loop in our track, but a completely different line, the MOB spur to Lenk. The completed line between Montreux and Zweisimmen was opened on July the 6th, 1905. It had cost 13 million Swiss francs and had taken just over five years to build. Our journey has taken only a couple of hours to cover the 62 kilometers of track. During that time, we visited 31 stations, passed over 62 bridges and through 19 tunnels. However, the stunning views of the countryside from any of the windows has made time fly. Though this is the terminus of our track, it need not be the end of the journey. You could remain on the MOB, taking the motor coach up the Simmer Valley to the resort at Lenk, some 13 kilometers away. In contrast to the route we've just traveled, the gentle gradients of this line enable it to be the fastest stretch of the entire MOB network. At Lenk, you can drink the mineral waters or take a walk in the beautiful mountains which surround the village. Zweitzimmern Station, like Montreux, is home to another railway company, this time the Spietz Erlenberg Zweitzimmern, part of the BLS group, whose standard gauge trains make the connection with the Lurchberg route to Italy, or after another change at Interlaken, along the meter gauge SBB Brunig line to Luzern. Plans are underway to link the two narrow gauge sections by laying a third rail, thereby enabling passengers to travel from the lake of Luzern to Lac Leman without changing trains. With beauty everywhere you look, from the picturesque delights of the chalets to the broad sweeping vistas of the mountains and valleys, the Montreux Oberland Benoit Railway can lay it all at your feet.